When you think of Python web micro frameworks, Flask is definitely near the top of the list. With almost 19,000 stars on GitHub, it's a powerful and extensible web framework. It even powers the bandwidth intensive audio delivery of the Talk Python to Me podcast. In this episode, number 48, we'll talk with Miguel Grinberg, who has written some amazing Flask tutorials, books, and open source projects. This is episode number 48, recorded February 2nd, 2016. I'm a developer in many senses of the word Cause I make these applications But I also use these verbs to make this music I construct it line by line Just like when I'm coding another software design In both cases, it's about design patterns Anyone can get the job done, it's the execution that matters I have many interests Sometimes Welcome to Talk like Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python The language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities this is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by Hired and SnapCI. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via at hired underscore HQ and at snap underscore CI. Hey everyone, I have a couple of news items before we get to Miguel. First, Miguel has generously agreed to give away an ebook copy of his Flask web development book published by O'Reilly. To be eligible, just become a friend of the show at talkpython.fm and I'll randomly select a winner during the week. It's been two weeks since the Kickstarter to launch my Python online training adventure kicked off. I have a few updates you might be interested in. The project is funded and well underway. The Kickstarter is over $14,000 and going strong. I launched a new website, training.talkpython.fm. Check it out. You can see the next set of courses I'm working on after the Kickstarter closes. Just click on courses in the nav bar. Once again, thanks to everyone who backed the project so far. If you want to get access to my course, Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps for over half off at $29, hurry over to talkpython.fm slash course and back the Kickstarter before it closes in the next two weeks. Now, let's get on to an excellent conversation with Miguel. Miguel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. You have a lot of stuff going on. This is going to be a fun conversation. I hope so. I'll try to make it fun. Yeah, yeah. We're going to focus this around Flask and look at all the different things you have going on kind of in that space. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Now, before we get into the details, let's talk about how you got started in programming, Python, all that stuff. What's your story? Yeah, so I first got into programming in the probably mid-80s, 1980s, with a TI-99 computer. You can Google it if, if you don't know what that is. <laughs> but it used to be a very cool computer in the age where you know computers were really new and most people didn't have them in their homes. And I started writing games in BASIC on a TI-99 computer. Eventually, that seemed slow, so I decided to learn the second language you can program on that machine. There were only two, and that was assembly language. And I started writing games in assembly. My gosh. So you took a, like a real easy sort of gentle introduction to game programming, yeah? Yeah. Those were the two steps you had on, uh, you know, on the TI machine. That is a big step. Right. There was no other thing. <laughs> so, and basic was slow. So, you know, what was the other choice, right? If you needed speed, assembly was the, the answer. So, yeah, I wrote a, a Tron lifecycle game on assembly language on a TI-99 computer. Oh, that's cool. Did you release it? I released it to friends uh, only yeah. uh, back in that day. So, uh, yeah, not commercially. Yeah, I mean, that basically predates uh, the web, right? So what do you release it to in some sense? BBSs maybe, right? Right, there were BBSs in those days, right? Yeah. yeah. That may be aging us. Yeah. I think I, I, think I can tell, still tell the actual connection speed based on the sound the modem made when it connected. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, that, that was. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my, my first uh, baud speed, the, the BPS speed was 1200. Oh, yeah. And you, you, can, you can put an age to me you know, <laughs> by, by knowing that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, just a little younger. I came in the 9600 days. Hey, I'm old. <laughs> okay, so you, you got into uh, basic and then assembly, and, yeah. and then where'd it go from there? So, and, and, and then, uh, so, so this was, I was a teenager, so, so but before college. So then in college, I learned, uh, you know, the languages that you normally learn in college, at least in those days, Pascal, C, C++, Smalltalk, 
basically get, get a job. So I'm from Argentina. And one of the things that's great about college in Argentina is that you can do it at night and work full time or you study. So I was lucky to have found a job, a programming job, you know, from the early days in, in my uh, college time. I had basically both sides, the academic side and the, you know, having to do something production wise, having to, to get something that works and that makes money all at the same time. So it was pretty good. Yeah, that's a really cool opportunity to have a chance to have, write like professional code or, or whatever you want to think of it as a student, because a lot of people come out of college and they're like, now let me have, try to go find some experience so I can get a job, right? Which is, it's a kind of tough place to be. Right. So thanks to the TI-99, I had some experience. So I, I could get a job without having a college degree. So, you know, I basically those two complement it and, uh, you know, allow me to, have a, you know, a full experience from early on in my life. So then Python came much, much later, maybe eight, nine years ago. I was working at a company where we had a, a really large C++ code base that was really painful to test. This code base was exposed as, as a uh, DLL, a, a C++ API on Windows. So I decided to create a Python wrapper so that the, the, the testers could write tests more efficiently. Right. They didn't have to write it in C++ and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. And compile it and test it oh, and crash and yeah. then do it all over again. Right. So I decided to create a the Python wrapper and basically I got hooked. I really liked it. So it started from there. Interesting. So you're working in C++ and then you made these wrappers. And I guess the thought process went something like, why don't I just keep working over here? Why do I have to go back to those compilers and headers and libs and all that stuff, right? Right. So exactly. And uh, in the same way I studied and studied and worked at the same time, when I'm working, even now, I always have lots of side projects that I do just for fun. So at those times, you know, eight, nine years ago, doing stuff on the web seemed to be the right thing. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so what, what can I do with Python for the web? You know, that led to, well, you guess it, Flask. <laughs> Yeah, so you have a lot going on with Flask. Why did you pick Flask over the other options? And, you know, given the timing, it might have been, well, there were not many other choices. But Django was probably around at that point, yeah? Django was there. Uh, Bottle was there, believe it or not. I did look at Bottle at the time. So basically, this was a, this is a funny story. I started, it was sort of a friendly competition with my wife. <laughs> my wife, who is not a technical person, she was blogging and she, she was having you know, pretty good success with her blog. And she was always teasing me that she was doing something technical and I, I was behind. I had to basically start blogging. Basically, that was the there that she put in front of me. So I said, if I'm going to blog, I'm going to blog on my terms. So I had to write my blog engine. Of course. <laughs> right? I'm not going to use WordPress or, you know, one of those. No, no, no. That has PHP in it. Exactly. Right. So I went and looked at Django and Django seemed overkill for a little blog that I wanted to write. I looked at Bottle, and Bottle seemed too little, right? I think that there were some things like writing more than one file. It wasn't clear how you would do it. You would have to start inventing things. So I settled with Flask. You know, Flask was right in the middle, and it seemed like the right balance. Yeah, I think, you know, I think finding that balance sort of depends on your experience, how you like to code, how much hand-holding exactly. you like it in some sense, right? Uh, absolutely. Like, I personally love to write my HTML just so and my CSS and oh. have lots of control <laughs> over the URLs and everything. And so these micro frameworks like Flask and, and Pyramid, I'm a huge fan of. Yes, I completely agree with that. With that, I micromanage my code. I really like to write myself and be aware of everything that's going on, make it very clear and make it very me. Yeah, Flask seemed to be the, the right balance of not having to deal with all the pain of uh, HTTP requests and responses. And, you know, Flask abstracts you from dealing with that. But at the same time, it doesn't hold me and I can do what I want, which is, you know, it was a requirement for me. You know, we had Armin Ronecker on show, mm -hmm. I think it was 13, one of the earlier shows and sort of dug down into a lot of the, the pieces of Flask. But maybe, you know, that's a long time ago. Maybe you could give people like a high level uh, look at just what the moving parts of Flask are and kind of like how you, how much work is it to get a, a website up and running? Right. There isn't really much. So Flask is very small. You can go read the code and you will probably understand most of it, you know, in, in your first read. It's, uh, you know, super clear code. It's code that I could write, the kind of code that I wish I could write, actually, because it's so clear. And basically, the, the main thing that Flask does for you is to abstract you from the uh, interface with a web server. 
You don't have to think about parsing HTTP requests or uh, formatting the responses. Basically, you get a decorator that allows you to associate a function that you have to write with an, an HTTP request. That's basically pretty much yeah. you know, the, the, the big thing that Flask uh, has for, uh, you know, for, for web development. And, and then you write your application. You supposedly need to know how to write it. Right, sure. So I'm trying to remember, like the Hello World app on Flask is probably five, eight lines. I think it's uh, yeah, seven lines, if I remember correctly. Seven lines, yeah. At least I got the interval right. <laughs> yes. So you have seven lines, four of which are boilerplate. So your Flask, your typical Flask boilerplate is uh, four lines, four lines of code. And then you write your functions. You write typically one per HTTP endpoint that you want to uh, support. And in the function, you, you do any processing you need to do and then return your response, which usually is, I mean, if you're doing a, a web application, is a string containing HTML that you can generate yourself or through a template engine. Right, and the default is Jinja 2, right? Jinja 2 comes with Flask. It doesn't need to, really. You can use any template you want, and this is a theme with Flask. For any X feature, you can use any package package that does X. It, Flask really doesn't care much about the, uh, the stack that you use. So yes, Jinja comes integrated. There's a very light integration. And that helps you with uh, generating the HTML. So you write your HTML in files and put uh, placeholders for the dynamic components. And then you generate those, you know, dynamic parts in your function logic. Right. And do you pass just like a dictionary off to the... Uh, Correct. Yes. And then Jinja 2, that's the replacement. Yeah. And then the, the view engine will put it together, right? Yeah. Exactly. So really... For a beginner, I mean, being able to get, you know, the hello world thing with, with seven lines and then start hacking it and uh, make it do more things, most beginners can get it right away, which is fantastic, right? Yeah, it is quite easy. I'm also a fan of Pyramid. and I like Pyramid a lot, but that step from zero to kind of I've got something I, I'm ready to start working with is much bigger than it is in Flask. I think to a large degree because of the packaging, you got to kind of deploy or, or set up your website as a package. Right. Honestly, I I see Pyramid more closer to Django than to Flask. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think Flask is much smaller, but I think one of the like the sort of superpowers of Flask is it's super small, but there's so many things you can plug into it, including a, a number of your open source projects, mm-hmm. right? Yes, I have written a, a number of things that you can add to Flask, which are all optional. And that, that's a big thing, right? In, in Flask, as I said before, you pick your components. So yes, I've written stuff to do WebSockets in Flask. That's actually the one that my most popular extension so that you can do uh, WebSocket and it does it in a way that is very flask friendly not the typical websocket thing that you see but basically the websocket connection is it's represented by a function that runs forever or at least through the life of the connection and in this extension that i built you handle events and these are short events that are built on top of the socket io protocol yeah okay very cool so it has a good side and a bad side the good side is that you know if you're familiar with http routes it's very easy for you to start doing WebSocket because with this extension, you you do it more or less in the same way. The bad side is that, you know, they're not the same. So a lot of people get confused about, I mean, they they think that they can do whatever they can do with HTTP requests. And the the fact that the extension makes it simple doesn't mean that, you know, you do have a request context, which you don't when when you're doing WebSockets, right? So Right, interesting. So that is something I wanted to ask you about while we're still down in the the details of Flask and and so on. Frameworks like Pyramid, they will pass a request object that has the request, the response, the headers, all that kind of stuff into your view methods. Or if you're using Pyramid handlers, it'll pass it to your class and you Mm -hmm. store it for later. Those kinds of things. Flask doesn't do that. It uses these sort of contexts that are ambient to your your code. And those are really cool. Can you talk about that a bit? Maybe how that works? I can. So this is possibly the the only aspect of Flask that can be thought of somewhat magical. It's only magical because a lot of people don't understand it. Once you understand it, of course, there's no magic. But yes, the idea is that if Flask didn't do what it what it does with the request objects and uh, you know other variables that are uh, request specific, you will have for each of your uh, handler functions, you will you have to receive a, a bunch of arguments, the request, and and then you you need to return the response. 
but but the, you, you may need the session and sometimes you don't need them so the way flask handles that is that it makes those available as context variables they're present uh, in every request you don't get them as argument you see them as global variables and i said they're magical because even though they look like global variables they're not they're really thread specific global variables so if you have a production web server running multiple threads, each thread will see, it'll look at this, for example, the request global variable, and it will see a different one. It will see the one that applies to that thread. That's a little bit magic that a lot of people get confused about. But other than that, basically, you know that when you get into a request handler, you have uh, access to the request as a variable called request. You have the session as a variable called session. There's a couple more, and, and then extensions can add more things using the same idea. So, for example, if you use Flask... Do they maybe just pile on top of the same pieces? Yes, they, they use the same... Uh, like the shared global context? Correct. So, for example, Flask login, which is an extension to do authentication, it has a current user. So, you know, that's always there if you are in a request. I think it's a very clean way to have those things out of the way if you don't need them, and then handy when you do. I really like that. Yeah. I enjoy, you know, not having those as arguments in my functions. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely nice and clean. Yeah, that, that's cool. So let's uh, take a moment to talk about your blog. So you said it starts by you writing your own blog engine because you're not going to be uh, ruled by one of these pre-built ones, right? Correct. Yeah, that's not my way. So I wrote the engine and, <laughs> you know, okay, so I'm done. I have a, a blog now and... My wife was still saying, well, you're not blogging. So <laughs> I had to start writing. <laughs> There's no, it doesn't matter if it runs. It, there has to be a post on it, right? <laughs> right. So right there with all the, the Flask experience of building the blog in my mind, what made more sense was to blog about Flask. So I started writing articles about writing, you know, a complete application, you know, using Flask. And that was how this uh, mega tutorial was born. This is a 17-part, very detailed Flask tutorial. It's starting to age a little bit. It's been written, I started uh, maybe four years ago, and I wrote it during a period of a year and a half. So yeah, that basically covers a bunch of areas. For example, I'm really proud that I, I have very good coverage for internationalization. Not very many people talk about, so you can learn how to do that with Flask. Ajax, which it's more common now with single page apps. That was basically a source of not only a way to teach what I learned, but also to, I mean, for myself to learn because it pushed me to learn more things, right? I, I wanted to do something more. Um, I didn't want it to look as, as a flask beginner, which I was at the time. Yeah, that's so true at the time. But then you go through teaching this stuff and you're like, well, if I'm going to talk about this, I got to know all the little details. And maybe you would, if you were going to write an app, you might only learn just enough to get the app working. But if you're going to try to teach it, you got to dig deeper. Exactly. I always say that teaching is the best way to learn. Yeah, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. I learn by teaching. Yeah, I think one of the ways that I think of it, uh, sort of conceptualize it, is if you were, say, a consultant and you went to work at, at a place and they say, you need to solve this problem. If you know one way to solve that problem, that's probably good enough, mm -hmm. right? You're ready for your job. But if you're going to go teach other people and there happens to be three ways to solve it, not only do you need to know the three ways, you need to know when to use which, what are the trade-offs, all that. Like Those are the kind of details you would just not bother with unless you have to teach it. So that's great. Yeah, correct. This episode is brought to you by Hired. Hired is a two-sided, curated marketplace that connects the world's knowledge workers to the best opportunities. Each offer you receive has salary and equity presented right up front, and you can view the offers to accept or reject them before you even talk to the company. Typically, candidates receive five or more offers within the first week, and there are no obligations, ever. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? Well, did I mention the signing bonus? Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $1,000 signing bonus. And as Talk Python listeners, it gets way sweeter. Use the link Hired.com slash TalkPython to me and Hired will double the signing bonus to $2,000. Opportunities knocking. Visit Hired.com slash TalkPython to me and answer the call. At the time at, at work, uh, still in the C++ domain, we were starting to do some things with REST APIs. 
also get an interest so, sort of in parallel when I got tired of writing mega tutorial articles, I will take a vacation from that and write about rest. <laughs> Right. So you basically have two really uh, large areas on your blog. And one is this Flask mega tutorial. And that would be a good place for if my listeners are out there and like, hey, I'm getting into Python. I, I, maybe web apps are cool. Maybe Flask is cool. How should I get started? Your tutorial is a good place? I think it's a good place. There are uh, warnings in the proper places in the tutorial where things got a little bit out of date. I'm going to give you just one example. Back then, I thought using OpenID for authentication was a cool idea. So OAuth wasn't wasn't that we were told Open ID was cool. We it, were told we, yes, we were told, and it, it it looked it was cool. I went with that, and of course, you know, today it, it's it's kind of a, an old thing. Yeah, that's right. One day I'm probably going to go, you know, refresh that portion of the article, that chapter. But yeah, right now you can still implement it. But of course, if you're doing anything for real, you will not do what I did back then. Sure. You could say, I, you can log into OpenID and your users would say, what's OpenID? Exactly, right. I mean, probably there's one or two providers that still support it and, you know, it's decreasing yeah. very quickly. So, yeah. so yeah. Okay, cool. So the Flask, the Flask tutorial sounds great. And then the other thing you focused on a lot was REST APIs. Yeah? Yeah, this was a, a mind-blowing when I learned about REST. You know, it, it seemed great. And, you know, I, I said, well, why, why didn't I think of this? It seemed like a very you know, clear way to organize and do the separation of concerns between the client and the server and, and write more uh, richer client applications. I really made an effort to learn. If you go Google REST, you're going to find there's a lot of discussions about what's RESTful, what's not RESTful. People who are you know, very angry at others because they're calling something REST and they think it's not. <laughs> you know. So let me see if I got it right. If I have a service like a, a website and it returns something. So if it returns like JSON over HTTP, it's a REST service, right? Uh, wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, you're, you're teasing. I'm going to start some kind of Restafarian war. You know, budget. <laughs> <laughs> so the REST ideas are great, but even if you go read the, the paper by uh, Roy Fielding, I mean, it seems like he's saying simple things, but, you know, hidden behind those you know, very sparse words, there, there are very complex ideas that you, you really have to think and make sure you understand. I did try to get to the bottom of it. I'm really not one of the, the angry people who think that you should call REST things that are 100% pure REST. I think REST has ideas that are very good. Even if you implement some of them, you're still winning. And I'm not going to complain if you call it REST, right? Because everybody does. Yeah, absolutely. I think that REST as a black and white concept was much stronger several years ago. And now people see it as a spectrum and they're like, you know, let's adopt HTTP JSON sort of APIs so we can talk to both iPhones and uh, web apps and, you know, other, just, it's almost a practical drive to adopt something like REST. Yeah. I think that it's a collection of ideas and, uh, some ideas are very easy to grasp and, you know, almost everybody say, yeah, this is great. The idea of having resources, right? Everybody gets that. And how to use get, post, put, and delete, that makes perfect sense. So almost everybody gets that. But if you start thinking about hypermedia, for example, which I think it has only five or six words in the original paper by Fielding, it's like it's mentioned in passing, right? I mean, not everybody or well, almost nobody get what you gain by implementing hypermedia. And for, for many projects, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. But for some, it does. So I wanted to understand, even if I don't always agree that it is a good idea, I wanted to understand what it meant and what you could do. And I even did a one of my PyCon talks, uh, the, the one I did last year. I showed, you know, a fully implemented hypermedia-enabled REST API, which was a uh, pretty fun project to do. Uh, another way that, that forced me to learn something, you know, to, to keep learning. Uh, I had to implement that in a way that the, the few hundred people that were there and then the people who watch it on YouTube won't, won't put my fingers at me saying, <laughs> yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I have seen that talk. That was that was a good one. And the title is, yes. Is Your REST API yeah. RESTful? Which I think <laughs> is a clever title, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, it plays on, on this continuously ongoing discussion between the people who want pure REST to be called REST and, you know, the people who say, well, okay, it's a REST API, whatever, right? I didn't implement all the items in the list, but still REST. Yeah. So one of the principles of REST is to sort of embrace the HTTP 
ness of of the transport, right? Like you said, you use the verbs and the the URIs and all those kinds of things, right? This is very interesting because if you go read the paper that you know the, the fielding uh, paper, he almost briefly mentions HTTP, and the mention the, the message there is that you could implement REST over other transports. So if you go by that document, right, sure. th- there's nothing that says that you should use get requests for this or that or post requests because that's HTTP specific. When you go and implement REST, you're supposed to map the ideas of REST into the transport that you're using. So, you know, all, all these rules that say that you should use... I think part of the reason that HTTP gets so tied up with REST is it's the only practical choice for a broad reach on the internet. That's correct. So to my knowledge, nobody is doing REST over something that is not HTTP. I'm sort of uh, a little bit disappointed that uh, Fielding or one of his colleagues didn't, didn't write something more specific to HTTP, because I think that's the source of all the confusion. It's that mapping, how you map what Fielding said in that original paper to the HTTP protocol, which allows you to do the same thing in many different ways, in a lot of cases. Right. So... Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I think you even mentioned this in your talk, that there's not like a reference implementation client server that you could go look at, right? Right. And there isn't one because it, really it's very difficult to make something that complies with every little thing that is mentioned in the, in the original REST documentation. And some things, you have to do the mapping, right? So they're not clearly specified so that you can find out how to implement that uh, with HTTP. So yeah, it's very interesting how the technology developed around it. And I think REST took off because at least some parts of it, as I said before, are very easy to grasp and they're very powerful. Right. And if you look at the alternatives, they were like XML SOAP web services with WS star specifications making it even more complicated and all that kind of stuff, right? Right. It's like, yeah, I mean, you you have boilerplate and you need to learn a lot of things. I mean, it's the same thing that goes on with Flask. Flask you can pick up really quick and REST, at least a portion of it, you can pick up really quick too. Yeah, I think REST is one of those things you can pick up quickly, but it takes a long time to master. Yes. If you wanted to get all the advantages of REST, definitely it takes a long time. I hope I did a good job on that talk because I I really try to explain in a very simple language, what each of the six uh, characteristics of REST mean and how they benefit you. I was still waiting for a picture on stateless. Yes. Because you had pictures that you're like, this one I can't do in a picture. It's stateless. What does that look like? I started with the idea of making pictures for everything, but yeah, no. <laughs> it would have been pretty hard to do stateless. Yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't have, a, I didn't have an idea yet. But, but yeah, the, the ones that I did pictures, I think the pictures in some of them, they do help drive the point home. I mean, especially caching and those things you normally don't think about. Yeah. And they are kind of important. I think they're important, especially if if you're doing something big, right? If if you're doing a REST API for controlling your garage door on a Raspberry Pi, um, you probably don't care about caching. Yeah. (laughs) But if you're getting paid to do a REST API, you should probably care about it. Yeah, you definitely should. So all of these posts and articles sort of led you to your next endeavor which was your book, right? So you wrote all these articles and O'Reilly reached out to you and said, hey, that stuff's cool. You want to write a book? <laughs> That's actually it, pretty much how it went. Yeah. This editor from O'Reilly, she was uh, basically looking for uh, Python content and she uh, ended up on my blog at the time. At some point, she came to Portland for, for a conference and we met. And uh, basically after that meeting, yeah, uh, she said, well, send a proposal. We really like to have a, a book on Flask. And uh, it, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And I looked through it somewhat. I haven't made it all the way through, but I really like it. I, th- I think it has a really nice practical style. It's not too verbose. It doesn't go into too many details, but it doesn't feel like you're skipping over so much. I think it's a really nice book. Do you maybe want to kind of talk about the theme? And you have this one kind of major app that you build up throughout this this book, right? Yeah. So it, it's probably a atypical book for, you know, for, for learning a framework. I decided to write it in a kind of a tutorial way. Basically, each chapter builds on the previous one. And by the end of the book, you have a complete application, which is sort of a Twitter kind of clone. I decided to to do it that way because people learn, in my experience, it's easier to learn, uh, you know, gradually. And if each chapter starts 
with a new project, you have you know you you lose your context. So so you you have to sort of start over. The do, doing it that way also allowed me to do something that I think it's also very original, which is h- how I have the code for the book on GitHub. When people tell me I'm crazy because it, it's a lot of work, but basically what I did is I engineered the history. I mean, us, using Git rebases, I engineered the history of the repository to be you know one commit per hit point. Basically, there are a few in each chapter, but. Each time you reach a point where you can go test something, there's a commit there. If I need to make a fix, I need to insert it in the right place in the history. So it, it's I developed a few tools to help me with that so that I don't make <laughs> mistakes, uh, because, right? Because it's crazy. I, I agree. I'm kind of crazy. Well, it's really cool from a reader perspective. So basically, uh, you start out the book saying, look, you need to know Git. Welcome to the 21st century. And you're a programmer, so you got to know Git. And here's how you get the code, right? You check this out. The you check out the um, repository, but then right. So yeah, then you I, go to tags, right? That are basically save points. Correct. Yeah. So you have uh, spread through the book. In any point where you are ready to try something, it tells you, okay, now you go get tag seven A. You know, they're named with the uh, the chapter number and then a letter. And so do you get that? And uh, if if you want to see what changed from the previous tag, you can do a diff which is awesome. Even on, on the GitHub uh, website, you can diff one commit and see exactly the. these are pretty small incremental changes. So if you want to find out how I did authentication, for example, you find the commit that does it and diff it against the previous one. And you see all the changes, not just, you know, the big stuff, every little thing, including template changes, every little detail is there. So if you want to learn with a lot of detail what, what you need to do to add that feature, you can find it in the diff. Yeah, I think it's a really, a really nice way to do it instead of having a zip file with, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three in it, right? Right. I started that way and it, it seemed wrong, right? And it's also difficult to maintain. So, yeah. so you know, overall, I mean, people criticized the book. Some people did. So far in the almost two years it's been out, nobody criticized the uh, the Git organization, right? The, the repository with the code. Interesting. That, you know, it's almost unanimous. You know, people like it. They seem to like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And so, you know, as far as I made it, I really like the book. It's tough to do stuff in public, out on the internet and other places. Like, it, you can't please everybody. So you just do the best you can, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's obviously, it's going to resonate with some people and it's not going to with, with some others. And, and that's fine, right? And these days, I mean, back in those days, this was the only book. But now uh, it's not the only book. There are like five or six or seven. So there's plenty of choice. It's a great ecosystem. Yeah, it is a great ecosystem. Yeah, and I, like I was saying, I think that's some of the power of, of Flask itself. and It's kind of mirrored in the books. So your work on your blog led to your book. Your work on your book led to some videos that you did, right? So these, as these things go, you do some minor thing and it just snowballs over time if you keep at it in ways you don't expect, maybe, right? Yeah, in ways I did not expect. That's actually true. The book went out, did really well. So O'Reilly was super happy with it. And they asked me to do uh, webcasts, which I did a couple. But then they said, well, maybe, you know, we should do more Flask content. So they asked me to to think about if if, if I wanted to do a video tutorial, basically a video version of the book. And that didn't seem right to me, right? Repeat the thing. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was kind of... You're like, I wrote it down. Right? Why do I need to do this? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's kind of actually boring for me, right? To do it all over again, you know, in a video. Yeah, sure. Instead, I decided to think about what else could I do in, in video format. So one thing that some people found the book was too easy. And some people found that the book was too hard, right? Both sets of people were right, right? Because each is its own person. <laughs> it's and, a relative statement. That's right. Right. I decided to write a introductory Flask course on video, which started at a much lower. So the, the book is kind of for, for intermediate. You, you need to know your way in Python to really take advantage of it. So this is much more basic. And the being on video, my, my screen, you can see my screen as I do the exercises. For a lot of people, that visual. Beginners find the, the visual component very inviting, right? That's how they avoid messing up. If, if they're reading it from a book, yeah. they don't see my terminal. They don't know what I type. So seeing you know, the, the very basic steps to build a web application being played in front of them, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I think these video tutorials where you're doing screen sharing, and especially when people are new, they can watch. I think it's really, I feel almost like you know, the blood pressure goes down, the stress goes down. It's just like, this thing that seemed hard 
I saw, I saw that guy build it up, and I saw all the steps. None of them were hard. None of them were confusing. Yeah, exactly. Started from here, went to there, and I can do that. Why did I think this was hard? But of course, if you're like running through the docks and you don't know where to start, it's a whole different type of thing. So that, that sounds really cool, really helpful. SnapCI is a continuous delivery tool from ThoughtWorks that lets you reliably test and deploy your code through multi-stage pipelines in the cloud without the hassle of managing hardware. Automate and visualize your deployments with ease and make pushing to production an effortless item on your to-do list. Snap also supports Docker and in-browser debugging, and they integrate with AWS and Heroku. Thanks SnapCI for sponsoring this episode by trying them with no obligation for 30 days by going to snap.ci slash talkpython. All right, so that was, that was video one. That was video one. Complete beginner with only a little experience in Python. You will do that. That will give you the basis. You will, you will know how to write simple applications with Flask. And then you can go to the book. Hopefully, at that time, the book will make sense if it didn't before. And then the second video that I did was specifically on REST APIs. And this is because when I was writing the book, I was in a constant fight with my O'Reilly friendly fight, I should say. She, she's awesome. But a constant fight regarding uh, page count. They wanted a relatively small-ish book. And I tend to put a lot of detail. I, I want to make sure things are clear, so I, I write a lot. So... One of the things that suffered in the book was the chapter on REST APIs. It, it, it's much smaller than I thought it should be. So I decided to expand on that on the video. And because I wanted it also to be fun for me, that video has uh, also uh, APIs for Raspberry Pi. So I have my Pi on screen showing you cool stuff you can do with the camera. It was a blast to do it. I, I enjoyed it very much. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. It's tough when you're starting out or you're teaching people who are starting out to make something that's interesting and engaging. And so if you can do things like that, like grab the Raspberry Pi and like show how you're controlling the camera and like even though the code might not be super complex, it feels like you're learning more than just a loop or a print statement or something. Right. You bring up a good point. I don't think that video is for advanced users. It's probably still in the intermediate level, but it's dedicated to REST APIs. I, I think that there's a lot more to say about APIs than what you get from the book. So it was a good thing. And uh, being able to show how to implement APIs on devices, like the Raspberry Pi, I think that was great. And that would be something more difficult to do in book format, I think. I mean, especially playing with the camera. I was in part of the video, I, I show how to do a time lapse. If there's an API to trigger a time lapse. So I have the camera pointed at myself doing the class, right, doing the course, and, <laughs> and then I play the, <laughs> I play the time lapse. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's pretty cool. It, it was really fun. Yeah, really nice, really nice. So we have uh, time for a few more questions. One thing I did want to talk to you about while we were together is your open source projects. Mm -hmm. But I kind of feel like maybe the way to do it is to give people a sense of what you've done, what's out there, and maybe some other time we'll come talk in depth about them. Yeah, so sure. So I'll, I'll tell, I'll say, I'll say one of your projects and you give me like the, the elevator pitch. One to two sentences, like, what is this? How's that work? Sounds good. All right, Flask Socket IO. I briefly mentioned it before. It allows you to do WebSocket applications with Flask that makes it super easy. Right, that's the, the continuously running function with events. Correct. Great. Yeah. And then Flask Migrate. Flask Migrate allows you to do database migrations uh, using Alembic, which is the migration engine for SQL Alchemy. So th this extension makes it very, very easy to implement migrations in Flask. Okay, interesting. I'll have to check that out. Flask HTTP Auth. For REST APIs to do authentication. Again, decorator-based. Like OAuth, that kind of stuff? This is not OAuth. This is a basic and digest authentication for an API. So if you're doing a straight API, it, let's say you don't have a web application, so you, you cannot do OAuth, which requires the web so that the user logs in. Mm. So you implement uh, token-based authentication, for example. This will give you decorators that basically prevent you from having to deal with the, uh, the headers 100%. So you can do everything in Python land. Right. You could deal with them yourself, but why would you want to, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Python Socket.io. Python Socket.io is one of my two 
non-Flask specific projects. It's, this is the engine to Flask Socket.io, the one that I mentioned before. So Python Socket.io is a general purpose Socket.io server. So you can do socket applications for any framework or just a plain, you know, no framework, just the Socket.io server. Since we're, we're talking about it, I, I would like to invite anyone who wishes to write a wrapper for other frameworks. I, I maintain the one for Flask. But if there are any, any, anyone interested in supporting Python Socket.io in Django, py- Pyramid, Bottle, whatever else, I would be more than happy to help. I see. So that would be the core. That's the core, correct. That you would use to build that and, and not have to basically maintain it, yeah? Yeah, it has no, no relation with Flask. Yeah, okay. Awesome. It's Python pure uh, framework. Sure. Okay. Flask moment. Oh, Flask moment. Flask moment allows you to use moment.js on the client uh, to render. Uh, so for, for example, you can do these uh, very cool uh, three seconds ago, three minutes ago, timestamps that are mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. very friendly. With, with this extension, you can implement those in Jinja templates. So the template generates the JavaScript code that then runs on the client to use moment.js. Yeah, that's really nice. And moment.js is live, right? So like, if it said five seconds ago, then it would say six and then seven and so on. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's awesome, yes. The way I implement it is it's optional. You can request not to do that. For some things, it doesn't make sense. But this extension will allow you to do that if you want to say, keep updating, you send refresh equals true in the template. And that's all it takes. Yeah. And, and then it updates on its own. Yeah, that's really cool. So you render the page, you look at it, it says 30 seconds ago, go grab a coffee. And then it says two and a half minutes ago, right? It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it changes. It's really nice. Yeah. Flask page down. Page down. So if you use uh, Stack Overflow, uh, the, the little editor where you write your, uh, your answers, that automatically updates Below, you see the render representation you type markdown, and you see it update immediately. So this is an open source project. It's a JavaScript library. So Flask page down allows you to use that in your applications. And again, implement it sort of, you think you're doing it in the server, but you do it in the Jinja template. And all the extension does is generates the JavaScript that then runs on the client. But at least you, you can have control of it from the server side. So that's what it does. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's really cool. It's coming to a climax with the open source project. The last one is actually called Climax. <laughs> climax <laughs> is, so th- this was a, a really fun one. I implemented it like in, in a weekend, two weeks ago, to be honest. So I really like Click, Armin Ronecker's command line, uh, decorator based command line parser. But there's one thing that I don't like. Yeah, it's cool. And we talked about that on his show when he was on. We talked about his, his work with Click. So. Right. So it's, it's another one of those things that I think, damn, I should have thought of that. Right. I, I'm, I hate the guy because he thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, one thing that I don't like is Armin's distaste of R parts. Right. He, he doesn't like R parts. And for some things that I'm doing, it would be useful for me to be able to integrate with existing, ex- existing applications that use R parts. So I created Climax as a clone. It's a blatant copy of Armin's uh, Click, but as engine, <laughs> it uses R parse. So that allows you, for, for example, you, you could take a, uh, a tool like, uh, say, uh, Alembic, which uses an R parse uh, parser for its command line, and import it into a bigger command that you own and offer you know, Alembic's set of options as a subcommand because it nicely integrates and you can compose bigger parsers by taking, you know, our parse, uh, parsers from different sources. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Okay, so I'll try to have links to all that stuff on and everything else we talked to on the, on the awesome. episode page. Cool. Okay, so let me ask you two more questions before we wrap it up. Mm-hmm. So last week or two weeks ago, you wrote Climax. What editor did you use to write it? <laughs> I use Vim with uh, the Python mode plugin. That's my uh, always go-to editor. Okay. I'm going to be honest. I know probably, I would say, five to six keys in Vim, and it makes me super productive, even though I, I know very little about it. I don't use any of the advanced things. But Python mode makes it really cool. I also like PyCharm. When I need to debug something really complex, I tend to go to PyCharm, but more, more for the debugger than the editor. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, the debugger in there is, is pretty sweet. So the other question is, there's 60,000 or however many packages on PyPI. What ones would you recommend people check out that maybe they haven't heard of? So, you know, they, they probably heard of requests, 
maybe Flask. But you know, what else? What else should people go check out that is maybe not well known yet that, that you want to tell them about? One package that I really, really like. Speaking of debuggers, I, I started my career working on Windows long ago, so I'm, I'm used to Visual Studio and the Visual Studio debugger, which is really, really good. So I'm, I'm used to interactive debugging more than GDB or you know console type debugging. So there's a package called PUDB. I'm not sure how popular it is. This is an interactive debugger, but it works in text mode. Say you, you are debugging something on a remote server or maybe on an AWS instance, you know something that you, you can only get through a shell. You can pop this thing, so pip install PUDB, and then it works like PDB, the command line Python debugger, but it brings up a GUI, text mode GUI, and it's really, really decent to work, and it runs anywhere, right, because it's text. I go to that debugger a lot when I'm debugging, you know, remote sites. It's extremely useful. Yeah, that, that's cool. You're SSH somewhere. There you go, right? You don't want to install. There's no way really to reasonably install PyCharm out there anyway, right? So it, Right, exactly. You can't. So it, it doesn't work for that. I mean, you may be able to set up remote debugging, but you know, it's, it's a hassle. If you need to debug something, Yeah, exactly. just put the PUDB package and, you know, you're good to go. It's, you know, super easy to use. Yeah, okay. Oh, good recommendation. All right, so... I guess, you know, people should go check out your book, check out your blog. What else should they be up to now that they've heard all about what you're up to? They're definitely invited to contact me, to interact, tweet me questions. You know, I I spend uh, a lot of time answering questions, whether it is uh, Stack Overflow or Twitter or, or comments on my blog. Probably spend, you know, on average, I'd say an hour a day responding to questions and I, I enjoy that that's another source another motivation for me to learn and stay you know current on things i'm really a person that i'd like to be engaged and so i invite everyone you know to send me questions problems ideas awesome yeah and uh yeah we, we, we'll all learn together yeah very cool <laughs> PyCon this year is coming to portland yay your hometown my hometown yeah i can still be my bed uh, yay i love that are, are you gonna make it Yes, definitely. I have my ticket. That's awesome. Are you going to make it? Yes, I, I, I'm going to be there. I think I sent uh, four proposals, so we'll, we'll see what happens. I hope I get to talk. Excellent. Yeah, good luck with that. I've been doing tutorials uh, the last two PyCons. Uh, this year I'm doing, a, I guess, an advanced tutorial. I hope I get it. It's to address the question that there's a common misconception that Flask does not scale. Interesting. Okay. I created a tutorial dedicated specifically to address all those concerns and show how to scale Flask. In three hours. All right. That sounds really cool. Like a really good follow on to your other ones. So that'll be great. I'll see you in Portland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was Miguel Grinberg. And this episode has been sponsored by Hired and Snap CI. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit hired.com slash talk Python to me to get five or more offers with salary and equity presented right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $2,000. SnapCI is modern continuous integration and delivery. Build, test, and deploy your code directly from GitHub, all in your browser with debugging, Docker, and parallelism included. Try them for free at snap.ci slash talkpython. Do check out the video course I'm building. The Kickstarter is open until March 18th, and you'll find all the details at talkpython.fm slash course. You can find the links from this show at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 48. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes and direct RSS feeds in the footer of the website. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. You can hear the entire song on talkpython.fm. Once again, this is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thank you so much for listening. Smix, take us out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best. Developers, developers.